Father, we have gathered here as your children to worship you, to praise you for your goodness towards us, for the gift of your Son, Jesus, for the joy that we have in Sabbath and the celebration of worship. And Father, may our words today bring honor and glory to your name. And there are those in this congregation, Father, who are traveling, who are in various places, and I just pray your Holy Spirit would draw near, that you would speak to their heart the deep things and the joyful things of your Sabbath and of your presence. And Father, for those of us that are here, may we be recipients of your Holy Spirit today, that we may hear your word, and it may do a work in us an important and deep work in us, we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our scripture reading is taken from Romans chapter 5, and we read verses 1 and 2. Romans chapter 5, Verses 1 and 2. May the congregation stand. We read Romans 5, 1 and 2. It talks about our faith that will triumph in time of trouble. Paul says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into his grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Amen. May God bless the reading and hearing of his word. Amen. Wasn't that beautiful? Amen. Now I have to ask those who are doing sound right now if you are getting sound. Henry, are you okay? Sherry? Ryan? How's it look back there? Everybody can hear? I'm, I'm sort of armed with batteries, so I have a lot of positive ions going off all over underneath my jacket here. And we're hoping it'll come all the way in. And, uh, well, I see what you mean. We need to, yeah, these are the ones. There we go. Um, I want you to think about this for just a moment. When the sun set, on the city of Haywood, California last night, every single person in this city entered into the Sabbath one of two ways. They either entered into the Sabbath, aware of it, cognizant that it was the Sabbath hours, entered into it with hope and joy and celebration, or they entered into it completely unaware, irreverent, uninterested, carefree. Every single person in the city entered into the Sabbath last night when the sun set. And they're in it now, and they will be in it until the sun sets this evening. How many of them do you think would love to share the joy of what I have experienced here and what you have experienced here in this church today? How many would love to have the joy that we have had here today? Wouldn't that be amazing? We have some things to do then, don't we? The sermon is about the Sabbath today. Maybe in a way you have not heard before, but I will assure you it is not new, but it is very important. So on the journey, it may not seem like a sermon about the Sabbath, but when we arrive at the conclusion, you will see what we are hoping to convey today. Would you pray with me? Father, this is your time. This is your word. This is your church, and these are your people today. So we humbly ask one more time for the sweet presence of your Holy Spirit Amen. that you will move among us today. And Father, that your word will have power because of you and your presence through your Son and through the Holy Spirit, we ask 
In Jesus' name, amen. The night I missed heaven because of the Sunday funnies. How many of you remember the Sunday newspaper when it would come with a fold out and a center page of full color comics? How many remember that? Do they still have it? I don't know. I haven't, I honestly haven't seen them for years. And maybe that's because I need to read more Sunday newspapers. My parents joined the church. I was probably around five years old. My father was a builder and a contractor, and he bought the farm when he was young, and I mean a real farm, and moved seven children out to the ranch, and then proceeded to buy about 200 sheep so that the children would have something to do to keep us out of trouble. And we moved into an old homestead that originally had three rooms. Dad doubled the size of the house by adding a living room and a kitchen. There was no heat in the home except the pot-bellied stove that was there when we moved in. And then I remember my parents eventually added a sheet metal stove. Now, I don't look that old, do I? Thank you. It's because of good vegetarian food. Now, in the process, we were so far out that we didn't get the newspaper. But my grandparents, who lived in town 10 miles away in Quincy, Washington, would save their newspapers and bring them out to the ranch on occasion so that we could use the newspapers to start the fire. And I was taught very early on, at about six years old, that we, as Seventh-day Adventist children, should not read the funny papers. Now, I'm going to tell you this story, assuming you will never meet any of my sisters, because they'll change the story. But I'm telling you the true story, okay? The way it would work is this. The stack of newspapers would be about this high, and it would get us through maybe a month and a half. And it was my job to start the fire in the morning. And so, you know, you'd wad up the newspaper and dad would have kindling or else he would teach me to do it, which eventually I did. And then you'd put the sticks in and on top of the paper and pretty soon you'd have a crackling fire and the house would be warm. Someone, and I am innocent, would take and sneak all the funny papers out from the Sunday paper and hide them in the bedroom, and then we would sneak in and read the Sunday funnies, knowing that good children don't do that. <coughs> I don't even think I could read. I could just look at the pictures, and sometimes one of the sisters, and I had five of them, would read for us. I remember the dream at six years old. Guilt had overcome me, and I was in this dream looking out across the 5,000 acres of rangeland and just off to the north and slightly to the east were what you call the Beasley Mountains. They were actually mountains. They weren't really mountains. And then if you looked far enough on a clear day, you could see just the top of Mount Rainier and some of the Cascade Mountains. But in this dream, it was black. And the clouds were deep gray steel blue to a deep black. And across the horizon comes Jesus. And I see him at six years old. And he's coming closer and closer and closer to me. Until I can look up and see his face. And he looks down and he shakes his head at me like this. Very much like my mother. And then he went on and left me behind. And I woke up. Now that's a startling dream to have when you're six years old, isn't it? But I want you to understand that we are given a picture of God by our children. Not by our children, yes, we get that too. By our parents and by our grandparents. And that picture of who God is is instilled in us it is actually a more powerful image than actually the one that is in the book. And if it is conveyed to us that the love is somehow conditional, then we grow up wondering if we will ever meet 
everything God expects us to do and to be able to accomplish it to be good enough someday to go to heaven. <coughs> Don't raise your hands, but how many of you think you're going to be good enough to go to heaven? I need you to think about that for just a moment. How many of you think you're going to be good enough to go to heaven? Someday we have to answer that question, don't we? Let's go on a study this morning. Romans 14, 23 says, And whatever is not from faith is sin. Whatever is not from faith is sin. Now, if you read the beginning of chapter 14, it's very interesting and it's probably not preached too often by Seventh-day Adventist pastors or laypersons because it begins chapter 14 with a, with a story Paul says that all those who eat vegetables are weak and those who can eat anything are strong. I'm still waiting for the amen. And, and so we kind of skim right over that because we don't really know what to do with it. And what I did is I just skipped over it and took you right to the very last words of the chapter, which is the point, whatever is not of faith is sin. And my definition of faith is a working definition that goes like this. Faith is saying yes to God no matter what the rest of the world thinks. And we'll talk more about that. Amen. Oh, look at that, it's right there on the screen. How did that happen? Say yes to God no matter what the rest of the world thinks. Therefore, faith is always an affirmative, it's always a positive, it is always a yes to God. Faith is not a noun where you say, this is my faith, and you put it up on the shelf, and it's a thing that you take faith down periodically and you exercise it. Faith is a verb in which implies an action of your heart moving towards God or moving towards your neighbor. Faith is always a positive and affirming response to God or to another human being. Always. It is never less than that. Let's continue. The Christian who lives by that yes to God, the Christian who lives by faith, has peace. Therefore, having been acquitted, declared not guilty, judged or justified by faith, all of those words apply, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We do not have peace based on how good our behavior was. We have peace in our life because of Jesus. Come what may, no matter how difficult life can be, whenever you encounter Jesus and you surrender the issues of your life to Him, He replaces those issues you surrender with His strength, with His assurance, with His hope, with His confidence. And we are a people that has possession of the peace that comes through Jesus Christ. And that is not earthly peace. Amen. That is divine peace. Amen. That allows us to stand, come what may, in your life or mine. Do you have that peace today? Let's continue. The word peace is a rene. In the original Greek, it's from a primary verb, most likely called ero. That word means, now notice this very carefully, to join. Did you know that, that peace means to join? That when you have the peace of Christ, it means that you have joined in something? That you have become part of a thing by joining it? It means peace that we understand in our own culture, literally or figuratively, or by implication, it means prosperity. Now, what would a prosperous peace be like? One that would continue to flourish and become bigger and greater and richer and fuller. What kind of peace would that be like? Would you like to have that kind of peace that is prosperous, 
that continues to grow and develop and something that is so intric intricate into your life that other people want to have that same peace that you have that comes through Jesus Christ. By implication, to prosper with God is to join in what He is doing. Have you joined in what God is doing around you in your life? Or is it that you are in your prayer life and in your personal life busy trying to tell God what He ought to be doing? Are we coming alongside the work that God is already doing in this world? Are we saying, now God, would you please, and then we have a list of things. I have my list, you have yours. That we just know that if we ask God to do, we can create some real busy work for God. And that's really great when you're in a board because then you can bring that busy list and have everybody in the church be really busy too. But have you ever prayed a prayer that says, God, would you give me that eye salve that you promised that I can begin to see where you are working, that, Father, I might join you in that work and come alongside. And when you join in with what God is doing, the result is peace. Think about this whole congregation. If every person in this room wanted to come alongside what God is already doing in a community. How do you know where God is already working? Then you better ask God to clean out your ears so that you can hear. Because if you're listening, you will hear where God already has His fingerprints on the hearts of other people. You'll hear in the line at the grocery store. People will be talking about things and they say, you know, it's almost like the world's going to end. And I've heard that so many times. You'll be standing somewhere in a public place and you'll listen to a conversation and people will be talking about God. You'll begin to notice that the more places you go these days, and I have noticed this, you'll be in a place and you will see people sitting at tables by themselves in cafes and restaurants and they will have a Bible on the table. Sometimes it's about half the size of mine. And you can see the pages are worn. And you know that there's a person that God has already been there. He's already working. Have you asked God to show you where He's already been so that you can come alongside and join God in what He's doing in the life of another human being? There's peace in doing that. Let's continue. Next slide, please. I'm going to read to you from Eugene Peterson's interpretation of Ephesians. Listen to it carefully. Chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. Not only has he written this in a very personal way, but I want you to know that he has sought to be very accurate as he, best he could in the original language, but speak it in the way we speak today. I want you to pay attention to how this is written. You've heard this verse so many times but probably not like this. Saving is all God's idea and all His work. Church, what do you say? Amen. All we do is trust Him enough to let Him do it. It's God's gift from start to finish. Amen? Amen. Let's go on to the next slide. We don't play the major role. If we did, we'd probably go around bragging that we had done the whole thing. No, we neither make nor save ourselves. God does both the making and the saving. He creates each of us by Christ Jesus to join Him in the work He does, the good work He has gotten ready for us to do, the work we had better be doing. Amen. Isn't that a remarkable paraphrase? Do you want to join God in what He's already doing? In the people's lives around you every single day. You will be startled at the response. Our being made righteous or not guilty or acquitted is never by human performance or the keeping of the law. 
I'm about to contradict myself, and I want you to pay very careful attention to see if you catch this. Where then is the bragging, Paul writes? It is excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? No. Can you read to me what it says in the blue letters? What does it say, church? But by a law of faith. Did you know there's a thing called the law of faith? What is the law of faith? Now laws must not be broken. What is the law of faith? For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Then do we nullify the law through faith? May it never be. On the contrary, we establish the law. So the law of faith establishes the law of God in the heart of a human being. How does that happen? Because when you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior... The law of faith says that you are willing to give your heart to the Lord, which He receives, and then what does the Lord do with your heart? No, He doesn't put it in the library and label it and stick it away for another day. What does He do? He made a covenant, a new covenant, and He said, I will write upon your heart my law. And then He gives you back your heart all new. But what is the driving, compelling force of a person who's accepted Jesus Christ by faith? Then the law that Jesus met the full requirements of has been written, where? Upon your heart, inside of you. So your compulsions and your desires and the direction of your life begins to change, maybe slowly on some things, radically on other things, but God is at work, radically changing the heart of every human being that will allow that. And the law of faith is the one that says, I will give you my heart by faith and trust you. And the law is then written and placed inside. And that's why by the law of faith, then the law of God is fully established where? right in here. Amen. All of the Ten Commandments. Amen. As only God can write them. Amen. The question is, are you willing recipients of what it is that God wants to write inside of here? He wants to write in here love to His Father. He wants to write in here love to your spouse Amen. and love to your children and love to your grandchildren and to every person in this room. But then he writes love on your heart so that you see every person in this world, as Paul wrote, no longer from a human point of view. That's New Covenant theology. And it establishes the law as a reality, as part of the essence of who you are as a Christian, as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. And therefore, the law is not something we do away with. It is now fully written inside of your heart. Are you in touch with what God is writing in you? It's the best news in the whole world, isn't it? Amen. It is good news. Let's continue. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws upon their hearts, and on their minds I will write them. At the bottom of the screen, there's two sentences. Have you made your heart available for God to write on it is the first one. But Romans chapter 1 verse 5 is the second sentence. And here's what it says. Paul says that he is in a ministry to bring about the obedience of faith among the Gentiles for his name's sake. What is this obedience of faith? We talked about the law of faith. Now we encounter a verse that says that we're to be about the obedience of faith. What is the obedience of faith? Every yes to God Amen. is an act of obedience, isn't it? Amen. But every yes is an act of love either to God or to your neighbor. And the obedience of faith is the manifestation of that law 
of love, love to God, the first four commandments, love to your neighbor, the last six, it is the manifestation of that law alive and functioning fully in your heart. Amen? Amen? Amen. And it changes one's worldview. Let's continue. God's work. These are very simple. Let's take the next slide. If you push that button, God's work is always perfect. Amen. Only God can do this work in you. Amen. You cannot write God's law on your heart yourself because you'd end up having to get, well, you'd have to go get it tattooed, maybe right here on your forehead in hopes that the ink would penetrate far enough into your mind. But wouldn't that be interesting to come to church they have to write the Ten Commandments pretty small, wouldn't they? No, we probably shouldn't do that. Only God can do this work, and God is infinite. Let's go to the next one. Our works are always faulty as human beings. I will tell you this sermon will fall far short of everything God wants it to be. Because the sermon isn't about me, it's about the Word of God. Amen. And it's not faulty. Amen. And it will not fail you. Amen. We need His work in us to be whole, to be mature, to be complete. And the King James, that would be the word for perfect. Amen. Be therefore perfect. In the Greek is the word for mature. It's a word used for picking fruit off a tree. A mature person is like a peach that has reached full sugar. You know how to tell when a peach is ripe on a tree? This is, this is important. You can't forget this. You take these two fingers. Go ahead, hold them up. This is a practice on how to pick good peaches. You reach up with these two fingers. You know that little crack down the middle of the peach? Reach up right to the top of that and gently touch the shoulders of the peach. If they are soft, that is a perfect peach because that means that the sugar is at full capacity and it's just soft enough you can tell it and you can go out into an orchard and pick a box of perfect peaches if you know how to identify one that is sweet. But that is the word for perfect that Jesus used. The word for mature. The, the word for fully sweet Christians. Are you a mature Christian? Are you having God work in you to grow you into the men and women He has called you to be? We are finite beings. When I leave this world, should I die before the Lord comes, I'm dust. How about you? All right, let's continue. Goodness is not an abstract thing. Let's move right ahead. God alone is good. Only His works are any account. Next one. Only the person who has God's work in them is righteous. That is the only righteousness that exists is what God does in you. And then it is manifested in your life by acts of love to God and to your neighbor. To be saved, we must have God's work in action inside of our heart. Are you having an action with God today? Because he wants to do some incredible things inside here. Next slide. Our human self-sufficiency rises up, and it did in this story. John 6, 28, Jesus is responding to a question. They therefore said to him, What shall we do that we may do the works of God? Now before we go to the next slide, what do you think you have to do? to do the works of God. I set you up for this. Okay? You know what the next verse is. Some of you do, don't you? Let's, let's take a look at it. This is the work of God, Jesus said, that you believe in Him whom He has sent. Amen. Now, come on, folks. Amen. Is it really true then? Am I just making stuff up here or is this the Word of God? Is this the Word of God that is speaking today to your heart? 
And is it true today in you because God has spoken it? Not Stephen McCandless. Is it true because God has spoken this thing to you in your heart that the work of God that you must do is to believe in Him whom He has sent? Do you believe in Jesus that He is Lord and Savior of everything in your life, including the gift of eternal life? Amen. Is He everything to you? Because that's the work Jesus said that we are to do and to we are to be all about. Now, isn't that an amazing, simple thing? Even though there's nothing simple about it. Because when you believe in Jesus and you accept Him as Lord and Savior, I've already said He wants to do a radical change in your heart. He wants you to become everything He has already written for you to do. He wants you to become everything He's already said you can be. And He has already been the author of your faith. And He's already written it in advance. Are you willing to believe in Him and allow Him the absolute freedom in the heart to do what He wants to do? Amen. That's an amazing thing to me. Let's continue. Faith is not a passive thing. It's always an action towards God or your neighbor. It is faith working through hard works, it is faith working through unconditional love. Amen. Bearing in mind, 1 Thessalonians 1, 3, bearing in mind your work of faith and your labor of love. You notice how in these verses those two words are connected deeply and cannot be separated? What happens if you take the word faith out of that? What kind of love do you have if there's no yes to God? You have the kind of love that's limited. It will only like other people as long as they meet your expectations and your requirements. It is the kind of love, and I said this in our Sabbath school class, and, and we're going to have a little group afterwards. I'm just going to say this now because I'll forget. Or at the end. For those of you who want to have a little journey on that class, we're going to do that after lunch today for a few minutes. But, folks, I want you just to, to think this through. If you have love without the faith, where you're doing pretty good, I'm going to tell you, that kind of love ends up being mean. Mean-spirited. It's the kind of love that becomes conditional that says, you know, I'm only going to like certain church members if they're vegan or vegetarian. Or I'm only going to like certain church members if they eat meat or don't eat meat. Now we have the whole discussion in Romans 14, the strong and the weak. And Paul says, please don't let your food ever hurt another human being. Don't you know whatever is not a faith is sin? But if you take faith and love, and if faith is always an assent to God, and it's the love you receive from God that is contained within the law, then that love becomes redemptive and saving kind of love. And that's what the world is waiting to hear. We call it the three angels' message. And it's going to grow and it's going to go with unstoppable power because it cannot be contained. But it has to be written here first before it can come out of your mouth. Amen. Amen. And that's good news. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all of the believers, that's what saints are, they are not statues. I think most of you are still moving out there. Amen. But you are all saints. Amen? Amen? That's good news. With all the believers, what is the breadth and length and height and depth was continue and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness. Filled up to all the fullness of God? Amen. How big is God? You mean He is going to make room inside of you to fill you up with all of the fullness of His Father? God is big, Amen. really big. Amen. And Jesus says that He wants you to be filled with the fullness 
not a partial fullness. Not, okay, you get this much on Thursday and you get this much on Friday and Sabbath, you get the rest. He wants you to be filled with all of the fullness. Can you just ponder for a moment what that's going to look like? I can't remember, I think it was a half inch cube of charcoal. Maybe you can go online and verify this, but I thought it was about a half inch by half inch. It might be slightly bigger than that. But the amount of space inside of that is so huge that it will startle you at how much room there is in a little cube of charcoal. I thought it was like a half acre or something. That's why charcoal is so good from a health benefit. If you have a toxin, it can absorb just so much. A little teeny piece of charcoal. Okay? But i got to ask you, how much does God want to pour into you of Himself today? All of it? Have you seen some of the new pictures from Hubble of Orion? Have you looked into the vastness of the universe in which we live and realized that we're 700 light years away from one of the nearest constellations or stars or whatever it is, 700 light years away? God is big, but he wants to pour himself into the heart of his church, into the heart of his people, into you right now today. Blessing beyond comprehension, compassion that is divine, understanding of things that you haven't even thought of to ask yet. He wants to pour himself into his church, starting with just you today. Have we wrapped our minds around this as Seventh-day Adventist Christians yet today? That we come to this encounter with Sabbath and worship and this is about God coming to tabernacle with His people to put His tent over you and to pour His unlimited love into your life. Amen. So that in your yeses to God, you can touch the life of a member of your own family or another human being. Are you willing today to be recipients of what the Word of God has spoken? And folks, I didn't make this up. I didn't write it. It overwhelms me even try to preach it because I can't comprehend it as a human being what that means for you because I can barely understand it for me but I know it's the truth and that's what God's heart is for his people and for his church today Amen. let's continue for in him that is Christ all the fullness of the deity of the God of the universe dwells in bodily form do you want to join in with God and have peace with Him? Because He has things planned that are big for you. Let's continue. God is in Christ and with Christ in the heart by faith the works of God will be manifested in you. Philippians 2.13 For it is God who is at work in you. Can I hear an amen from the church? He is at work in you. Sometimes you're not even aware of it. I have to tell you, um, third generation Seventh-day Adventists left the church, went out into the world as a secular humanist. Told you part of the story last week. But you know, I used to kind of enjoy having a glass of wine and other kinds of things that weren't healthy for me. Thought it was the way of the world. I have not graced the doors of the church for a long, long time. We were living in Everett, Washington, and Sherry and I went to the grocery store. And in Albertsons, they had built a huge new store up there. Biggest grocery store I'd ever seen in my life. And I remember walking in and they had a huge wine section right in the front of the store. It was huge. You can just imagine anything, if you were a connoisseur, that you wanted most likely could have been there. But I remember going in that store and walking all the way past and going down one of the aisles with Sherry going for groceries. 
And this thought occurred to me that not only did I not even think about that huge department, I just walked completely by, but whatever had been in the house, we hadn't even touched for quite some time. I was not even aware that that transition had taken place in my life. But all I know is that that kind of thing that I did was suddenly removed out of my life and it startled me to stand there in that grocery store because I still hadn't even thought about church. Amen. But all I can tell you is that God was already at work in me and took that away. Amen. Because that's what God does Amen. in us. And it would be just a few months later that I would walk into the Kirkland Seventh-day Adventist Church for the first time in about 10 years. It's an amazing truth, isn't it? For God who is at work in you to, listen, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. Amen. For His good pleasure. You want to be part of the pleasure of God. Amen. Not the pleasure of men. You want to be part of the pleasure that exists in the heavenly realm today on this earth, now, in this moment. You can join in with God and have part of the things that are His pleasures if you're willing to receive them, church. That's what God wants to do for you today. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Our work is to cooperate with what God is doing in us. Amen. But friends, we need to slow down long enough to become aware of the things God is doing here. Let's continue. God is at work in us. It is for us to discover what He is revealing and changing, forgiving and healing through the Holy Spirit. Colossians 1.27, my favorite passage. To whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Do we have any Gentiles here? I see one hand. Okay. All right. We'll talk about that some other time. Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim Him, notice the rest of this, teaching every man so that we may present every man complete. Now that word complete is that word mature, and that word mature in the King James you will encounter is the word for perfect. Amen. Now you know what perfection means in the King James. It means that you're grown up, that you have matured, that you have become complete. How many of you have grown up? Oh, don't raise your hands. That's not fair. But we may present every man mature and complete and perfect in Christ. What, what makes that maturity happen? It is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen? Amen. All right, let's continue. His works were finished from the foundation of the world. This is Hebrews 4, 3. His works were finished from the foundation of the world. Remember on creation day? God created the earth. And then what did He do on the Sabbath day? He rested from His work. Was His work imperfect? Or was it perfect? Was it a whole work or a partial work? Was it a mature work or an immature work? It was a mature work. Now that's how we know the chicken came first, because it was a mature chicken, right? We just solved a huge scientific dilemma, theologically. And did God enter into His rest on the Sabbath day? Amen. Did He? Amen. Well, some of you aren't sure yet. Amen. His works were finished from the foundation of the world, for He has said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all of His works. Amen. Amen? Now, what does that have to do with you? Sitting here in this room today. Let's go to the next slide. The person that does not live by faith cannot enter into God's work, the work he rested from, Hebrews 4 verse 5, and again in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. 
Now, we who believe can and do enter into God's work, God's perfect work, because if we believe in Him, then He is at work in us. We have entered, we have joined in His work, resulting in peace. Amen. Only if you have done that by faith. If you have not entered into His work by faith, if you enter into His works by your works, there's nothing to cover that rest. It doesn't exist. So if this is true, let's go on to the next slide and see what it says. The Sabbath is the seal of justification by faith. Why? It is the sign that we have given up our sinful works to accept God's perfect work in us. Have you surrendered everything in your life to God so that He may do His perfect work in you of growing you up into the men and women and, and I want to include our boys and girls, our young people in this room. Have you submitted everything so that God is growing you up? Are you doing that as part of your yes to God? Yes, Lord, here is everything that I am. Do with me what you want. Are you entering into that by faith? We enter into His rest through faith in Jesus Christ. Let's go to the next slide. The Sabbath is the seal of justification by faith. Ezekiel, verse 20, verses 12 and 13, you're very familiar with. You've heard this a hundred times, if not more. But I will read it to you one more time. Also, I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. The Sabbath is the sign of God's work of sanctification in you that you have entered into His rest today because you are allowing Him to do His work in you. Amen. Have you entered into God's rest by faith? Sabbath is not a work, but it's a rest of our faith in God. We are here today to worship the God who is at work in us. Amen. And we've entered into His day of rest to find the joy of God having His will manifested in our life. It is not my will, but Thine be done. Amen. Amen? And today is the day we enter into His rest from that work. And this is the day He has come to be with you, to fellowship with you. No other day has been set aside like today. Because this is the day of recognizing and remember we are resting from our attempts to save ourselves. We are entering into our rest that it is the work of God at work in us. And that's what makes Sabbath so joyful that we have joined God in His perfect rest. Let's continue. No other day can be a mark because only on this day did God enter His perfect rest from His perfect work. Amen. Next slide, please. Sabbath is the only day connected to His work in you. Today is the day you celebrate Amen. what He is doing in here. That you have rested from your works to accept His work. Amen? Amen. This is an awesome day. If you are doing your own work, listen carefully, you can never enter into His rest on the Sabbath. The Sabbath rest is only connected to those who accept God's work in them by faith in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Is Jesus everything? And are you entering into this day to rest in the perfect work of God that He wants to do through His Son in your life? This should be the most joyful day Amen. because this is the day to remember that we have surrendered everything that we thought we could do better than God. Amen. To accept God for who He is as our Father in Heaven. That He is the one who is doing a work in us and He is doing a work around us and He wants you to join Him in that work. Amen. Are you willing to do that Amen. today? Let's go to the next slide. To choose any other day to celebrate a Sabbath rest is to deny God's perfect work in us and is a faith that is still maturing. 
However, to celebrate Sabbath as a duty or a work of justification is a far greater concern. Because if you enter into Sabbath and do it because you have to to be saved, that is not entering into the Sabbath by faith. That's right. It's entering into the Sabbath by your human effort right. to save yourself. And there is no rest and there is no joy in that Sabbath. It can never be found. Whatever is not from faith is sin. What do we make of the Sabbath today as Seventh-day Adventist Christians? Do we make it a day that we are entering into God's completed and perfect work and we're celebrating the surrender of our own human works, our sinful works that have no merit, as a day of joy and of fellowship with God? Or are we doing this so that we can get our point and go home and go about our business. Which is it? The whole city entered into Sabbath at sundown last night. How did you enter into the Sabbath? By faith? Or oh my goodness, here's Sabbath. Okay, Lord. I'll give it to you this time. At my convenience, not yours. Is it by faith as a day of joy and celebration? Amen. Amen. Let's go to the next slide. <coughs> Jesus answers the question, how you might find peace and rest. Let's read the verse. This is the work of God, John 6, 28. Next slide. And just push those next two buttons, please. Will you enter into this work today? One more. That you believe in Him who He is. Has sent. Amen. Would you do that today? Amen. That our Sabbaths may take on a dimension of something fresh and something new, something that is spiritual, something that has life in it, because it is a manifestation of the power of God, the fullness of the deity that dwells in you, that you are here because of what God is doing inside. And you bring that joy of His fresh work in you all week. Amen. And today is the day we celebrate the presence of God. We could call it fellowship. It's okay. Yeah. Celebrate may be too scary for some. Yeah. We could call it friendship. That would be good. Amen. But you know, God was really about barbecues. Remember the prodigal son? Yeah. They had to kill the fatty calf and put it on a spit and have a barbecue. He wanted a party. He wanted a celebration. He wanted joy in his church on the Sabbath. Do you have the joy of Christ Jesus today? Because you are so grateful that you can rest from your works. Do pray with me. Father, this has been your day. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you for your word that has come to us today. Amen. Amen. Thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit that has been here, for your holy angels that have come to fill this room, Father. Oh, that we could hear their voices join us. Someday that will come soon, won't it? Father, may we find deep joy in your Sabbath, as not yet fully experienced by your church. May we rest, Father, in your work that is being done in us through your Son and through your Holy Spirit. May it bring joy in our hearts. And Father, again, we just praise you for your mercy and for your kindness and your love towards us as your children. In the name of your Son, Jesus, we ask. Amen. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us. Have a blessed Sabbath. Please be seated.